Hey friends, welcome to season four of the No More Silos podcast with me, Dr. Erica Santiago. As your host, we'll be exploring the letter to the Hebrews. It is an exhortation filled with timeless truths and theology, deep insights, and a call to faith. And we will also uh, be talking about our new collection of Bible study resources available exclusively on our Patreon page. Join our Patreon community to gain access to these resources and become a vital supporter of the No More Silos mission. Let's remember that our faith is a shared endeavor, so let's grow and learn together. Thank you so much for those of you who are already supporting us on Patreon. We really appreciate your support. It allows us time and resources to be able to continue to develop new content just for you. And now, today's episode. Hey everybody, welcome back to another episode of No More Silos. My name is Erica Santiago and this is my podcast. Hey everybody, welcome, welcome, welcome. I'm so glad that you have decided to continue this journey into the letter to the Hebrews with me, where we learn about Jesus as God's son, we get warnings against drifting away, and most importantly, we get theology. You know, as I mentioned in the introduction to this uh, short kind of series subset of episodes here on No More Silos, talking through the intersection of culture and faith and history and scripture, I have to, I, I have noticed over the last few years in conversations I've had and in classes and, co- and questions that come up from students is that theological understanding is sorely lacking. And, and even among people who are, who are preachers, um, I've met folks over the years that I just sit there and I go, where did you get your theology? How are you missing this? And then I realize it's the same question I had 10 years ago when we got going in full-time ministry, when I looked around and I said, you know what? I don't know anything. I've been in church my entire life and I don't know anything. I I can tell you the names of the books of the Bible. I can spell most of them. I bet I I just felt like I just didn't know what I needed to know to be a successful disciple maker. And so that began the, my journey of deconstruction, and you guys have been with me through some of that and, and the reconstructing process and how I managed to do all of that in school for, gosh, six years of school, two master's degrees and a doctorate. And I still some days wake up wondering if I know what I need to know to be a better disciple maker. And I, and and that is why I look at it as a journey. It is a journey. So don't beat yourself up like I did. Um, it, it's a journey. When we are learning theology, when we're learning about what it is we think about God, what it is we understand about God, what it is we understand about our beliefs and, and doctrine, it is so important for us to, to give ourselves grace, to, to accept the grace from God, that's made available through Jesus Christ that allows us to be on this journey, but be on it in a way that says, you know what, I know enough to tell the person behind me how to take the next step. And that's all we ask. That is all anybody can ask. That's all any of us can do until God calls us home to glory, as one might say. And so, Today we continue our conversation about the letter to the Hebrews. Last time we were together, we talked about authorship and how I think that Priscilla may have been the author of Hebrews, and I provided some uh, resources in the show notes for that. And if you take our uh, the course uh, that, well, I don't want to call it a full-blown course. Well, yeah, there is a course, but before we get to that, If you are subscribing to the No More Silos Patreon, I want to give you an extra special welcome and thank you for your support. And I want to thank you because you are making it possible for me to continue developing content, doing the research, the homework, the study that is necessary, and oh, and buying all the books um, because I've now run out of uh, Amazon gift cards from my birthday six months ago. (laughs) So um, thank you. It really, I I can't say it enough. It makes a world of difference to me and, and just 
your support and your prayers and knowing that you're listening out there uh, to these episodes and hopefully growing as a disciple of Jesus Christ and, and providing resources for yourself and for others um, so that you can be better prepared for your next small group study. And so that's why we're doing this uh in-depth overview of the book of Hebrews, just to give you some uh, resources to talk about things like the Trinity and soteriology, which is salvation and, and Christology, who do I think Jesus is, and the Holy Spirit and the, the third person of the Trinity and the creation and scripture and ecclesiology, the church. What is the church? Why does it exist? What are we supposed to be doing on Sundays? And does it matter that we do it on Sundays or can it be done a different day? And eschatology, the end times. And we've talked about that in recent episodes, eschatology, uh, the theology around the end times. But I want to start with quoting what's in my New Living Trinity. Translation Bible here uh, of Hebrews chapter 2, verse 1. It says, So we must listen very carefully to the truth we have heard, or we may drift away from it. You know, there was a book that came out. Uh, late summer, early fall, the great dechurching, and I've talked about it here on the podcast. And so many people are leaving the church not because of the truth that they have heard but they're leaving because of a lack of follow through on that truth, a lack of spiritual evidence that that truth has really penetrated the hearts of people who claim to be Christians. And so the book of Hebrews gives us a resource, gives us uh, the knowledge, the information that we need to be able to to really drill down um, in a small group setting or maybe just amongst your friends that you're reading the Bible together. And so that's the kind of resources that we're developing on the Patreon site uh, to provide resources for you. So there's uh, going to be some videos. Uh, I'll talk about some of the books that like kind of book clubby kind of way um, that I'm using to develop these resources. Um, we will also have a lesson resource, video lesson resource that you can use with your small group. And we'll have other resources there as well for you to download and just, you know, have it as a takeaway. So I thank you for your support on Patreon. And I really do, really, really, really do appreciate it. So let's take a take our time today exploring Christian doctrine through the book of Hebrews. I actually taught on this as part of uh, the Seminary Saturdays class that I did at our church this fall. And I probably didn't do it complete justice because we had so much to go through in that course. And uh, that is why it's being redeveloped as an online course. That's why I mentioned that a moment ago. Uh, not there yet. I'll have it soon. but And I'll let you know as soon as I do. But the book of Hebrews explores key theological concepts that form the foundation of Christian doctrine. And this episode of No More Silos, we're going to talk about uh, the Trinity, we're going to talk about salvation and Christology as it relates to theology. And in the next episode, we'll cover the Holy Spirit and creation. And I have two book recommendations that I've already talked about on the podcast, but I want to deep dive into those to really bring home that theology, like what we believe, what we what what a healthy Christian uh, disciple making outlook is probably should be for us. And and then I'll probably end up making it so as not to belabor the point here on No More Silos, but do scripture, ecclesiology, and eschatology out of the book of Hebrews. Uh, that'll be exclusive for exclusive content for our Patreon supporters. Uh, so uh, today I want to begin with who Jesus tells us he is. And he tells us this in the Gospels, and each of the four Gospels at some one point or another talks about who Jesus is. And in John's Gospel, we probably have the most overtly theological Gospel account with Jesus in his I Am statements found in John's Gospel in chapter 6 and chapter 8 and some other places. The context is, is that Jesus is saying, I am, dot, 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 revealing his divinity and his identity as the Messiah. And these statements, they echo the Old Testament names of God showcasing his authority, provision, and salvation. And the first major ecumenical councils, which I'll talk about uh, today, were convened because of the challenge to explain the Trinity and Christ's divinity. The word Trinity in English is actually borrowed from the Latin word Trinitas, which was first used by African church father Tertullian in the 2nd century, I think, 2nd century, to describe 
the triune nature of God. According to uh, Edimon Online, uh, which is an etymology website that only nerds like me probably use, early in the 13th century, the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit constituting one God and prevailing Christian doctrine, um, that is Trinity. That's where we get our English word Trinity. But Trinitas comes from Tertullian, and he is using the Latin trinus, or threefold or triple, the plural form trini, three at a time, threefold, to explain the Christian idea or theological idea that that God shows up in community, that God shows up in three persons. And Tertullian was a prolific early Christian uh, author and theologian from Carthage in North Africa. Uh, Carthage was a Roman province. And he, during the second century, when the Roman Empire was still vast and wide, and he's responsible for quite a bit of our theological understanding and provided the foundation for the biblical canon in his, in that his writings supported the use of the 27 books that made it into the canon, uh, the New Testament canon, as authentic. One of the things that we look at, that scholars look at, listen to me, including myself and scholars, um, (laughs) that scholars look at for the authenticity of a book of the Bible uh, when the canon was developed was how the apostolic fathers, how the folks that had hermeneutical proximity to the early church, to the people who were eyewitnesses, hermeneutical proximity is a, a, a phrase that simply means that they were probably only a few generations removed from people who were eyewitnesses to the resurrection, eyewitnesses to Jesus's teachings, eyewitnesses to the uh, to the twelve uh, disciples, apostles' teachings, eyewitnesses to Junia and Priscilla and Aquila's teaching, uh, eyewitnesses to Paul's teaching. People who heard it from the horse's mouth, so to speak, and they quoted excessively and extensively in their writings that have survived through the centuries. And so Tertullian is one such person. So even though he lived during the second century, his writings quote from the books uh, that became the uh, part of the canon. And we talk about that in detail on, on our episode about how we got our Bible. So what is the Trinity? The Trinity, and you should really care about this because the Nicene Creed affirms the Trinity. Uh, 95% of Christian churches affirm the Trinity. Those who do not are technically classified as cults or a nicer way might be alternative religions to Christianity, even though several of them like to call themselves Christians, which is well, I got into that in the last episode. I'll leave that alone today. But the the Hebrews, the letter to the Hebrews, is one of the best resources for new te- for the New Testament for learning theology. Romans is too, but Romans is really long and very detailed, and it is um, it doesn't include as many Old Testament references to kind of bridge that gap for especially for those of us on this end of Christianity 2000 years later who are trying to look at this big thick book on our desk and go oh my gosh where do I begin so if you're a new Christian or you know someone who's a new Christian and they ask you what should I read first have them read John's gospel have them read Matthew have them read Luke but and and acts but when it when they're done with that part have them read hebrews and then have them read ephesians and galatians because those ephesians and galatians as pastoral letters are are letters that help you with christian living like how do i live what how do, what does it look like to live a life of repentance how, what does it look like to change direction in my life what should i be expecting uh, what is that fruit what does that fruit look like that's galatians and ephesians but hebrews helps us really articulate philosophically what it is that's going on and more recent scholarship suggests that perhaps it was Priscilla, who was one of Paul's disciples, um, who wrote this letter for Jewish Christians. And we talked about that in our introductory episode last last time we were together. The doctrine of the Trinity, and a doctrine is simply, by definition, a doctrine is simply a way of saying, this is a definition. This is what we believe. It, the doctrine of the Trinity is the belief that one God, who exists in three distinct persons, the Father, the Son, Son being Jesus Christ, and the Holy Spirit. And so the Trinity in Hebrews uh, highlights the Trinitarian nature of God. In chapter 1, verses 1 through 3, 
the deity of Jesus is emphasized. This is so important because Thomas Jefferson, as we talked about in one of our very, very early episodes from way back in 2020, when we talked about historical Christianity and and, uh, how Thomas Jefferson and and other uh, Freemasons believed in dualism, where they, Thomas Jefferson literally took an exacto knife to his Bible. It's, 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 documented. They actually have the Bible. It's in a museum in DC. He took what we would call an exacto knife to his Bible and cut out all of the supernatural parts because he didn't believe in the supernatural aspect of the the deity of Christ. He thought Jesus was a good teacher and he said some good stuff. And I think honestly, that's reflected in how Thomas Jefferson lived. But anyway, you can read, um, Hear about that in that episode. Hebrews chapter one through uh, chapter one verses one through three emphasize right off the bat the deity of Christ as the radiance of God's glory and the exact representation of His being. And Hebrews chapter nine verse fourteen highlights the presence and work of the Holy Spirit within the Godhead, the within the the community of the Trinity. This understanding of the Trinity guides our worship and our relationship with God. Here's here's what it says. And this is important for us to to know. Like as a Christ follower, long ago, first one reading from the New Living Translation, long ago God spoke many times and in many ways to our ancestors through the prophets. And now in these final days he has spoken to us through his son. God promised everything to the Son as an inheritance, and through the Son, He created the universe. The Son radiates God's own glory and expresses the very character of God, and He sustains everything by the mighty power of His command. When He had cleansed us from our sins, He sat down in the place of honor at the right hand of the majestic God in heaven. Now, that does not mean that Jesus is uh, subordinate to God. It means in in that context, in Near Eastern ancient writing context, in their cultural context, that he was equal to God. That place of honor was an, uh, a place of equality. So Jesus is equal to God, the Trinity, all three parts, three persons distinctly present, but each having a different, uh, different role in, in, in our salvation. So the writer of Hebrews starts right with that. And then in, by the time we get to chapter 9, it says, uh, they write, just think how much more the blood of Christ will purify our consciences from sinful deeds so that we can worship the living God. For by the power of the eternal spirit, Christ offered himself to God as a perfect sacrifice for our sins. So what we see here in the, in, in Hebrews, it's re- that The Trinity is revealed here, and it's in new language had to be created by the time Tertullian comes along, right? Because, and just like Merriam-Webster has a new word, a new word of the year every year, or there's new words that are added to the dictionary. In fact, I think I saw the other day, because I'm probably, you know, maybe you, maybe I'm the only one out here that follows Merriam-Webster online, but uh, they announced recently that the word authentic is the word of the year. It is is been used by everybody. Everything's authentic. That's the word this year. But the Trinity uh, would, would have been the new word in Tertullian's time, right? So it reveals Jesus, reveals the Holy Spirit, reveals Scripture. And remember, we've talked about this before, Scripture to the New Testament writers was the Old Testament. When they point to Scripture, they're pointing to, not to themselves, they're pointing to uh, their inter- what they think they're doing is interpreting Scripture. They think they're interpreting the Old Testament and telling us what it says. And so the incarnate Jesus, Jesus coming in human form um, and connecting with us that way, the experiential nature of the Holy Spirit and Scripture, what the Bible says, what the Old Testament said about the coming Messiah. And as I mentioned last time, the scaffolding that the Old Testament is to the building that is the New Testament. So the, the Trinity is revealed here in Hebrews. And so I want to, and I'm going to stop there. There's, you can Google uh, infographic and Trinity, and there's some really good ones out there that you can take a look at to understand the Trinity. Trinity is probably the hardest thing that anybody asked me early on in ministry. Like, can you explain the Trinity? And I was like, nope. 
I just know that it is. And that is not a sufficient answer all the time. It is initially, but not really. And so it's something that I had to work work my way up to. And I still some days probably don't quite understand it. I just accept it. And that's okay. Like really, it is totally okay to be like, you know what? There's some things I'm not going to understand and, and I'm okay with that because I'm not God. Soterology, and I'm probably not even saying that right, S-O-T-E-R-I-O, L-O-G-Y, is the study of salvation, including the doctrines of sin, redemption, atonement, justification, and sanctification. Now, if you were uh, Protestant, you've heard of these doctrines. Um, You've probably heard people say, I'm justified through Christ. I'm sanctified through the Holy Spirit. And sanctification is the process. It's a journey we're on. In Hebrews chapter 2, it says, Because God's children are human beings made of flesh and blood, the Son also became flesh and blood. For only as a human being could he die, and only by dying could he break the power of the devil who had the power of death. Only in this way could he set free all who have lived their lives as slaves to the fear of dying. We also know that the Son did not come to help angels. He came to help the descendants of Abraham. Therefore, it was necessary for him to be made in every aspect like us his brothers and sisters, so that he could be our merciful and faithful high priest before God. Then he could offer a sacrifice that would take away the sins of the people. Since he himself has gone through suffering and testing, he is able to help us when we are being tested. And that's Hebrews chapter 2, verses 14 through 18. In John's gospel, most theological of the gospels, you have the cross, you have the resurrection, and and, uh, when we get to... um, you get the John. Uh, you get the resurrection, and then when you get to Acts, you have uh, Pentecost and post-resurrection, and this new life in the Holy Spirit. And what does it mean to repent? Well, it simply means to turn away from sin and towards God. And so sometimes when we tell people, "Oh, we want you to to say this prayer and believe in Jesus that He is your Lord and Savior," we don't always focus too much on the repentance part, that you stop doing the bad stuff and focus on God. And then the Holy Spirit, that self, through that salvation, we are empowered to be able to do the good things. Not just be a good person, but actually do the good things that a good person would do because we've turned away from sin. We've repented. Um, our justification is forgiving our sin and making us right with God by faith, not by what we do not by works, but by faith, because we simply believed. And our sanctification is a gift of grace and God's work of making us holy, which means like Jesus, like Christ. And so uh, the author of Philippians, uh, which is Paul, says, Dear friends, you always followed my instructions when I was with you. And now that I am away, it is even more important. Work hard to show the results of your salvation, obeying God with deep reverence and fear for God is working in you, giving you the desire and the power to do what pleases him. And he's talking about the Holy Spirit being in us and dwelling in us. And that's covered in uh, in. Hebrews in chapter 2 verse 11 it says so now Jesus and the ones he makes holy have the same father we are one with Jesus we are experiencing uh resurrection power through Jesus and the the cool thing in in Hebrews is that we are able to to see that and here's what's interesting to me about salvation is that it's a community creating event the trinity operates in community even though it is one, it is when when God creates the heavens and the earth in Genesis, it says, "Let us make man, make mankind, make humans in our in our image." And Jesus takes on that human form so that He can help us stay on track with repentance and teaches us what it is, what it looks like, how to He models the behavior He wants us to engage in. And so it's the community that helps us stay on track with repentance. But we all know folks who try to do that part by themselves, and then they're crushed when they fail at changing their ways. And Because no accountability exists when you try to do things by yourself. You need people. God said it's not good for us to be alone. We were created to be in relationship with God and with one another. And that's what salvation allows us to do. In the book of Hebrews, this letter to the Hebrews explains the doctrine of salvation. Um, 
in chapter 9, it talks about Christ's sacrifice on the cross obtained eternal redemption for all believers, emphasizing the efficacy of his atonement, um, of his sacrifice. Uh, it Chapter 10 declares that through his sacrifice, believers have been perfected forever, emphasizing the completeness of Christ's work. And this understanding of salvation, this understanding of soteriology, encourages us to trust in the finished work of Christ and live in the freedom. Remember, the sun sets free is free indeed. The freedom of salvation. All this is in Hebrews. So let's look at this, this passage together. My Bible helps me out with section headings. I'm reading from the New Living Translation. Your Bible might be a little different um, in in the English translation, but it, and your headings might be styled differently. Your section headings might be styled differently, and that's okay too because they're put there by the translating committee, so they're completely uh, arbitrary to whatever the salvation uh, salvation whatever the translating committee was like oh let's call this section old rules about worship or Christ sacrifice for all or Christ is the perfect sacrifice so when we look at chapter 9 in the beginning it says old in my book in my bible it says uh, old rules about worship it's drawing a line in the sand it's letting us know the, the translators are letting us know hey this is new Here's what we do now. And this is why I get so frustrated with folks that preach so heavily or or one-sidedly from the Old Testament. Not that that's a bad thing per se, but as chapter 9 opens, it says that first covenant between God and Israel had regulations for worship and a place of worship here on earth. And then you scroll, go down a little bit. Verse 11, so Christ has now become the high priest over all the good things that have come. He has entered that greater, more perfect tabernacle in heaven, which was not made by human hands and is not part of the created world. With his own blood, not the blood of goats and calves, he entered the most holy place once for all time and secured our redemption forever. Under the old system, the blood of goats and bulls and ashes of a heifer could cleanse people's bodies from ceremonial impurity. Just think how much more the blood of Christ will purify our consciousness from sinful deeds so that we can worship the living God. For by the power of the eternal spirit, Christ offered himself to God as a perfect sacrifice for our sins. That is why he is the one who mediates a new covenant between God and people so that all who are called can receive the eternal inheritance God has promised them. For Christ died to set them free from the penalty of the sins they had committed under the first covenant. Let me let me pause there from chapter 9, because I just said a whole lot. It's when we spend too much time focusing on what was going on in the first covenant and not recognizing that we are living under the new one, we miss out on the freedom. When we get caught up in the rules and regulations of Leviticus, that's why so many people, when they start reading the Bible for the, uh, try to read the Bible in a year, go, oh yeah, I was doing good until they started describing the jewels on the breastplate of the priests. Yeah, nobody cares about that anymore. It's right here in Hebrews. Jesus says in the Sermon on the Mount, I have fulfilled what was old. I have fulfilled this. I am here so that we can move forward. Because what we were doing before, it wasn't working. Under the heading, it says, uh, going into chapter 10, Christ's sacrifice once for all. Chapter 10 opens up the old system under the law of Moses was only a shadow of a, a, a dim preview of the good things to come, not the good things themselves. Remember, N.T. Wright said the scaffolding. The sacrifices under that system were repeated again and again, year after year, but they were never able to provide perfect cleansing for those who came to worship. If they could have provided perfect cleansing, the sacrifices would have stopped for the worshipers would have been purified once for all time and their feelings of guilt would have disappeared. But instead, those sacrifices actually reminded them of their sins year after year. For it is not possible for the blood of bulls and goats to take away sins. And then in my Bible, it kind of breaks out into poetry or or a a block quote for those of you that are web designers. Verse 14, for by that one suffering, he forever made perfect those who are being made 
holy. And the Holy Spirit also testifies that this is so, for he says. And what's interesting, the writer of Hebrews quotes the Holy Spirit here. And, and you know, in, in Paul writes to Timothy that the Spirit has written the, the scriptures, right? So the belief here is that the Holy Spirit wrote the Old Testament. Because what comes next in verse 16 in chapter 10 is a quote, a direct quote from Jeremiah, from the prophet Jeremiah. So here's what Jeremiah says that's quoted. And um, I didn't look into this, but I suspect this quote is not from the Hebrew, but from the Septuagint translation, um, which may be part of the reason it's a little different than what's actually in Jeremiah, or maybe the author of Hebrews just decided to take some creative license with with their quote. But it does reference um, Jeremiah chapter 31, which I recommend reading that chapter in its, in its context. I did read that um, when I was uh, setting, getting ready for this recording today. So the Holy Spirit also testifies to this, where he says, this is the new covenant I will make with my people on that day, says the Lord. I will put my laws in their hearts and I will write them on their minds. Then he says, I will never again remember their sins and lawless deeds. And when sins have been forgiven, there is no need to offer any more sacrifices. So here we go. We got Jesus walking around in the four gospels talking about, hey, you, your sins are forgiven. Oh, and you're healed too, by the way. And so guess what? No more sacrifices. Or uh, people who would have heard that, especially observant Jewish people, uh, practicing Jewish people, would have been like, oh, well, in the Gospels we see this, you know, who does he think he is? But by the time we get to Hebrews, we're, we know who he is. And we are like, wow. So there's no need for sacrifices. Jesus, Jesus was it. There's your theology around that point. The other thing I thought was really interesting in this quote in verse 16, it says, I will put my laws in their hearts and I will write them on their minds. One of the things that we talk about in the context of salvation is that it's a heart thing, right? It's a heart and a mind. It's orthodoxy and orthopathy. It is what do I believe in? What do I believe in, in deep down in my soul? So theologically, if I really do believe that Jesus is Lord, then I am obedient to his commands. And what are his commands? To love God and love people. And the way I show I love people is by a short way I, I show the way that I love God by the way that I should love people. It's on my heart and I get it in my head. Like I, I, I get it. And so, um, the prophet Jeremiah, the, the context of that whole quote, I definitely recommend reading that, but I want to move on uh, for the sake of time. And again, I'm creating resources that will take this even deeper for you if you are so interested, and that'll be on uh, No More Silos Patreon site for our Patreon subscribers. But the third theological concept I want to introduce to you today is Christology. And we just kind of touched upon it, right? Who is Jesus? Who do I think Jesus is? emphasizing the supremacy and sufficiency of Christ. Hebrews chapter 1 portrays Christ as the exact representation of God's nature and his role as the sustainer of all things. And then in chapter 2 highlights Christ's humanity and his role as our compassionate high priest, emphasizing his ability to sympathize with our weaknesses. This Christological understanding deepens our appreciation for the person and work, the ministry of Jesus, inspiring us to follow him wholeheartedly. And one of the things I'm just looking it up now, how um, how we understand Jesus, our Christology, the question of will, um, the questions that come up in the ecumenical councils, the question of grace in the human condition and sin in uh, the question of uh, the Holy Spirit and our understanding of who Jesus is, Christ being our the divine human. And there's so much in the New Testament that goes through that. And it's just really interesting to me, I'm trying to find a quote that I really liked. Here it is. Cyril of Alexandria 
talks about the the unity of Christ, and and this is a big deal because this is what the early church and early church fathers and mothers were really focused on, really trying to understand Hebrews 1 and 3. It says, the sun radiates God's own glory and expresses the very character of God, and he sustains everything by the mighty power of his command. When he had cleansed us from our sins, he sat down in the place of honor at the right hand of the majestic God in heaven. In Hebrews chapter 2, it says, therefore, it was necessary for him to be made in every aspect like us his brothers and sisters, so that he could be our merciful and faithful high priest before God. And then he could sacrifice, uh, then he could offer a sacrifice that would take away the sins of the people. Remember what Jeremiah said. And since he himself has gone through suffering and testing, he is able to help us when we are being tested. It's this profound declaration about the empathetic, empathetic and redemptive role of Jesus that gives us our context for human salvation. Um, it's that community creating event, the brothers and sisters, there was culturally in that time period, no higher relational connection than your brother or your sister, your sibling connection. That's why the early church referred to each other, the one anothering, the love one anothering as our brothers and sisters in Christ. Even your spouse was your brother or sister in Christ, anything you would do. And somehow we've managed to separate that in the Western church. I don't know why I don't get it, but Cyril of Alexander says this. He says, Indeed, the mystery of Christ runs the risk of being disbelieved precisely because it is so incredibly wonderful. For God was in humanity. He who was above all creation was in our human condition. The invisible, the invisible one was made visible in the flesh. He who is from the heavens and from on high was in the likeness of earthly beings earthly things, the immaterial one who could be touched. He who is free in his own nature came in the form of a slave who, he who blesses all creation became accursed. He who is all righteousness was numbered among transgressors. Life itself came in the appearance of death. All this followed because the body which tasted death belonged to no other but to him who is the son of by nature. And that was Cyril of Alexandria on the unity of in his um, writing on the unity of Christ. And and here's the thing, for well into the fifth century, there would be debate about the uh, humanity of Jesus versus the divinity of Jesus. And this passage in Hebrews uh, identifies Jesus with humanity, uh, talks about him being the merciful and faithful high priest, talks about how um, he has come to atone for our sins, um, how he empathizes with our suffering, how he's able to help those of us who are just dealing with the trials and temptations of life. And the theological implication ultimately is incarnational theology. And we're going to talk about that in greater depth when we get to the doctrine of creation next time. But incarnational theology is foundational uh, to the belief that the eternal, that, that, that the Son of God took on human flesh, that he, he wrapped himself as a innocent baby, born of a woman. You don't get any messier and graphic uh, uh, possibility of 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 how coming becoming human he could have he just showed up i mean like literally jesus really could have the incarnation could have been all about okay so jesus just shows up as a 30 year old man as human he could have just uh, poof, appeared but he went through the human experience start to finish from being in the womb to being born in that process, to being raised to the vulnerability that, you know, in, in, in a day and time when kids t- died by the time they were age five, like that was a regular thing. Some people, uh, cultures, surrounding cultures in the world didn't name their kids till they were like five for that reason, because it was like hard to survive t- your early years. And we see that in the Gospels, how hard it really was. They had to like run to Egypt. They had to run away. Like there's all this stuff going on. Jesus in his incarnation dignifies 
all human flesh and the denigration of women for being bloody and birth and such. And it's all undone. And for the final redemption. An example of cultural Christianity in the uh, different and the differences between the West and the Eastern Church's view on the Trinity and, and theologically who Jesus is and divinity is the East focuses on the Trinity and celebrates the kingship of Jesus, his resurrection, while the West is concerned with the incarnation and Christmas and in the Roman Catholic Church specifically Mary um, and we gone to the opposite end of that spectrum in the Protestant church because we're like, no, we're not worshiping Mary. We're, you know, that's good that that happened. So, but we probably have missed it on that too. Was ideas probably somewhere in the middle. So this is why being a theologian yourself, understanding what you believe is so important because does, why does it matter? Here we are getting closer and closer to Christmas. By the time this, this episode posts, will be in the middle of the Advent season where people are talking about hope and faith and love and and go tell it on the mountain that Jesus Christ is born. It's a big deal. But then we're ho-hum when it comes to Easter, which is actually the bigger deal. And we see that in Hebrews. It's a bigger deal that theologically our portrait of Jesus uh identifies not only as the merciful and faithful high priest who through his identification with humanity becomes the ultimate uh, atonement for our sins, but it also invites us to approach Christ confidently, recognizing boldly to the throne of grace, boldly understanding and recognizing that he gets it. He gets us with our human struggles. And as a cornerstone of Christian doctrine, When it comes to uh, what we believe around the doctrine of Christology, of emphasizing Christ, not as as part of the Trinity, but we, we see our Savior. And he's also our King. That's our Lord, that person that we follow. And so... There were several ecumenical councils in the history of the Christian church that addressed the issues related to Christology and the divinity of Jesus. And notable among these councils were the first big one, the one at Nicaea, where we get the Nicene Creed. The focus was on uh, what is known as the Arian controversy, affirming the full divinity of Jesus. And the outcome was the formulation of that creed, the Nicene Creed, emphasizing uh, that Jesus was of the same substance as God, true God from true God. Now, it might seem like, you know, splitting hairs. And for us all these years later, we're like, well, duh, of course. But this was a big deal that they really had to iron out. And you see, it still becomes a big, is, is a big deal. If you got Thomas Jefferson over there with the exacto knife, cutting up his Bible. It also was addressed in the First Council of Constantinople in 381 AD, um, where they expanded on the Nicene Creed, clarifying the divinity of the Holy Spirit and further affirming the full divinity of Christ. And so the outcome was uh, an amended Nicene Creed um, that is to this day recited in Christian liturgy. Um, The other council that was important was the Council of Ephesus, uh, 431 AD. I think I've talked about all of these before on the podcast. Um, The focus uh, was uh, addressing the what was known as the Nestorian controversy. So every time these councils, these ecumenical councils had to come together was uh, church leaders from around the region, from the five major uh, church locations, uh, which would have been Antioch and um, Constance, Antioch and Jerusalem and Rome and Alexandria, uh, among others, getting together to deal with heresy. In the last episode, we talked about how heresy actually was a good thing for the church because people coming up with the wrong ideas forced church leaders to explain what were the right ideas uh, with better clarity. And so the outcome of the Council of uh, Ephesus actually had to do with Mary as the mother of God and formulated the Theotokos, that's a Greek word, um, doctrine that affirmed the title of Mary as mother of God to underscore the unity of Christ as a person, as a human. And that's a big deal. You should read up on that because 
if you grew up Catholic, you grew up worshiping Mary, sort of kind of weirdly equal to Jesus. And that's not quite what Protestant, that is absolutely not what Protestants believe, um, that Mary was a, uh, was a vessel, but she's also Jesus's first disciple. And she's a model servant and uh, of God. And so she is there from his birth to his death to through his resurrection because it's noted in Acts that she's there in the upper room when they're waiting for the Holy Spirit to come. And so she's a big deal as a woman of God, but not to be worshipped as part of the Trinity, as part of who God is. So it's, it's, it's the unity of our... Uh, she represents our connection to the humanity of Jesus. And then uh, the fourth one is, that I want to mention today is the Council of uh, Chalcedon in 451 AD. And that was another big controversy, the monophysic contra- controversy affirming the dual nature, divine and human, of Christ against those who emphasized a single divine nature. Now, the outcome of that council was defined as the Chalcedonian definition, asserting that Christ is acknowledged in two natures without confusion, without change, without division, without separation. And all of these councils together... Uh, Nicaea, Ephesus, Constantinople, played a c- crucial role in establishing orthodox Christological doctrines and refuting the heresies that threatened the understanding of Jesus Christ's divinity and humanity within the framework of Christian theology. And the Nicene Creed and the Chalcedonian definition in particular remain foundational statements of Christian faith and doctrine. Here's why that is important today, drawing it all the way to today. If you have most Christian denominations or sects or or flavors, if you will, of Christianity all affirm the Nicene Creed and the Chalcedonian definition, then that sets a foundation for theology. Anyone that, that deviates from that, then now their Christian theology is called into question. And there's still some folks who have uh, a problem with the Chalcedonian definition, but in um, in the work of Vince Bantu, Dr. Vince Bantu, uh, gosh, and I can't think of the name of his book. I've talked about it on the podcast before, but he, talk, he gives a lot of uh, time to this in his book because it matters between the East and the West church. The issue boils down somewhat to Greek versus Latin in language. I mean, by the time we get to the Council of Chalcedon, it's 451 AD. Latin is pretty much a more dominant language in use between uh, in the church than Greek is. And so now we have our our initial translation, Bible translation issues starting to show up. It's not just a matter of what people thought in their theology, but now we've got translation challenges. And if you've ever talked with someone from another culture and another language, you know that um, sometimes we just don't do a great job of translating. We lose things in the translation because what the literal translation doesn't line up and the cultural meaning behind something also doesn't line up. And so that's part of the problem with the Chalcedonian definition. Probably two in the weeds for you today um, on that one, but I want you to understand, I want you to know as a faithful No More Silos listener that there's more to this whole question of the divine nature and the human nature historically in the church then meets the eye. And this is what some denominations have divided over. This is uh, what some major branches of the church have divided over. And so it, it, it matters. It ultimately does matter even to today in our unity as followers uh, and believers in Jesus Christ. And so if you're watching from the sidelines and you're not a believer and you're just listening to No More Silos because you like the sound of my voice and uh, find the history tidbits interesting, um, yeah, it's it's a big head scratcher on from a historical standpoint. But it is worth understanding, taking the time to understand, because when you are listening to someone preach a sermon, their theology matters, who they think Jesus is, who they think the Trinity is, what they are teaching. Because, you know, we we point to Hebrews 11 all the time. Uh, Faith shows the reality of what we hope for. It is the evidence of things we can't see. And through their faith, 
the people of the days of old earned a good reputation. Who are these people and what did they do as examples of faith? Uh, One of the things in my personal devotional reading last week that I observed in one of the Gospels was Jesus really getting excited about someone's faith. If you want to know what excited Jesus, was faith. Faith in him. Well, we don't believe that he was both divine and human, who he said he was. Guess what? That changes our faith. What are we believing in? So I'm going to end here. Next time, uh, we're going to jump into the Holy Spirit and um, continue on as we're walking through Hebrews together and um, also referencing learning theology with the church fathers. I want to thank you for your time today. Thank you for listening. And thank you especially to our supporters uh, on Patreon. Please follow me on Instagram at Cultural Christianity and also on Patreon at No More Silos. Thanks so much for listening and have a great rest of your day.